Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Like, <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Today is Wednesday, November 22nd, 2023. Coming up on Roller Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. The economy, looking at all the right numbers, is doing well, yet many Americans still say it's going bad. I talked with White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre about the messaging of the Biden-Harris administration and what they are doing to get the word out. Also, George C. Wolf directs the Netflix movie about Byron Rustin. Coleman Domingo stars as the great civil rights leader. I talked with both of them about this often forgotten civil rights icon. Also, I chat with uh, Attorney General, former Attorney General Eric Holder about his efforts to fight on behalf of African Americans and others when it comes to the right to vote, but also fighting to stop gerrymandering all across this country. And I talk with the director of the movie, The 24th. It is about that black regiment in 1917 involved in a race riot in Houston, Texas that led to the largest murder trial in history, court-martialed of 110 black members of the U.S. Army and the execution of 19 of those men. It is a fascinating story, and they finally have been exonerated. Folks, it is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. So much has improved in this economy, yet when you look at polling data, voters don't feel that way. Well, the Biden-Harris administration understands that they have been trying to get the message out about how things have gotten. I sat down with Corrine Jean-Pierre. She's the White House press secretary talking about what they have done to improve the economy and why it's not breaking through. Uh, Kareem, when I look at, and I I cover this stuff all the time, when I look at the economic numbers, when I look at inflation, when I look at unemployment, when I look at stock market, look at all these things, uh, it it is showing an economy that has rebounded, uh, that has recovered uh, from those dark days of 2020 and 2021. Uh, Yet, when I look at poll numbers and when I'm on social media, folks swear this is the, the worst of the worst. Uh, and so how do you deal with and how are you finding this perception that, oh, my God, the, the, the roof is caving in and everything is awful? Well, first, let me just say, Roland, thank you so much uh, for having me. And you're right. I've watched your show and you've been very fair in laying out where we are and what this administration has been able to do as it relates to the economy or just more broadly as uh, as an administration, how we're trying to move the, the country forward. And so. Very thankful uh, for to have you right doing that and having your voice, especially as we're going into uh, Thanksgiving and happy Thanksgiving to, to all your viewers. Look, we get we understand that what 
people in this country has gone have gone through over the last two, three years have been very difficult. Right. You think about the pandemic and what that did to people and how we're coming out of the pandemic. And so we know, right, when we walked in, the economy was in a tailspin. It was because of the last administration and how they mishandled the economy, how they mishandled COVID at the time. And so we went into we went into this administration dealing with an economic tailspin. And then after that, we had to deal with an inflation that was affected by what Putin was doing. President Putin was doing in Ukraine with invading uh, with invading uh, uh, Ukraine and causing a war. And so that caused inflation to go up. And so we understand that people are still trying to get through this, right? There's still some folks are not exactly feeling the successes that this administration has been able to do. But it is my job, as you know, just like it is your job to be straight with people and tell folks what's going on. It is my job to be, for the president, to speak on this on this administration and lay out, lay out what we've been able to do. You think about 14 million jobs created under this administration. You think about unemployment at under 4%. You think about which is, I know this is something really important for our community. You think about insulin being capped at 35 bucks a month for our seniors. That is so important. That is so important because people are paying so much a, a, a month for health care. So we were able to lower the cost there. You think about 2.3 million more Black Americans are employed than when the president took office, right? That is important. The unemployment rate for Black Americans when we walked in was at 9.2. Now it's at 5.9. There's still work to be done, but it, it did come down. You think about black net worth is 60%. It's up 60% since the pandemic. So I, we are just going to continue to have these types of conversations with folks like you and continue to get our message out. You're going to continue to see the president talking directly to the American people about what we've been able to do. Going into Thanksgiving, we're seeing gas prices down by a buck 70 uh, since the peak. We're seeing car rentals down by 10%. We're seeing airline tickets down by 13%. You know, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving dinner fell uh, this year, but the cost of Thanksgiving dinner fell. Eggs, eggs, milk, bacon, uh, fresh veggies are down. This is the fourth cheapest Thanksgiving uh, that we've had ever, that we've had as a percentage of, of average earnings. So there are things to talk about, and we're going to continue to be very clear with the American people, but we, we get it. We get that some folks are still feeling this because what we went through was incredibly difficult for American people in the last two, three years. One of the areas that uh, I think uh, uh, when we talk about crisis. Uh, a lot of that was driven by corporate greed. I remember the congressional hearings. Yeah. Uh, they, were talk, they were talking about inflation uh, and, and where in 65, 70, 75 percent uh, was caused by companies just jacking up prices. Okay. Uh, how aggressive are y'all going to call that out? Because that still is the case. When I look at people talk about uh, rent going up, it's because we have a housing shortage in this country. We did not build as many homes between 2000 uh, in 10, 2020 because of the home foreclosure crisis. And then you have private equity owning, you know, thousands upon thousands of homes and people are being forced to rent. Uh, and so is that going to be something that's called out and, and, and putting those companies on the front street uh, that are choosing uh, to earn record profits over the expense of the American people? And I have and I have to tell you, um, Roland, this is something that the president calls out all the time. He calls out what we're seeing from corporate corporations. Uh, he calls out anytime he talks about his economic plan. Uh, one of the things that we've been very consistent on, and I think you've reported on this, Roland, are the junk fees, right? We have we have been very good at dealing with junk fees that cost Americans billions and billions of dollars, whether it's junk fees from a credit card uh, that they're that they have. So we've done that. You know, we have and not, and not just called it out, but taken action to save Americans some money, um, to save some American, Americans money monthly uh, uh, or throughout or throughout the year. And as you talk about housing, you know, protecting uh, Black Americans' uh, excess housing and home ownership, uh, including efforts to combat housing discrimination, is something that we have done right through HUD, uh, as you know, with. Um, um, uh, Secretary Fudge, her leadership, she understands. Uh, she's the Secretary of HUD. She understands what that means. And so does the President, obviously, uh, understands that what that means, and the importance of creating wealth for Black Americans. And so that's something that we've done, provided a record-breaking $163 billion in federal procurement opportunities to small businesses. So creating Black wealth 
is also a way to combat that as well as calling out uh, uh, corporations who take advantage uh, of communities like ours. One of the areas uh, that a lot of African-Americans are still not happy with was that at the George Floyd Justice the Policing Act uh, was not made law. It was passed by Democrats uh, and uh, Senator Tim Scott, Senator Lindsey Graham didn't get it done by bringing over Republicans uh, in uh, the Senate. Uh, but, but one of the, and I get the executive orders and those things that were signed, but, but one of the things that, uh, that I, I've never understood why the White House is not touting more. I mean, what's mm-hmm. happening in the Civil Rights Division, uh, Christian Clark, they're, they're, they're killing it in terms of uh, these police patterns and practices investigations, uh, police officers who have actually uh, been sent to prison, jail wardens, correction officers. Uh, and are, are we going to see the president really highlight that work because they've been holding people accountable? Uh, yeah. and, and, and frankly, it hasn't gotten lots of attention. I mean, every time one of these people go to jail, we cover the redlining uh, investigations uh, and the settlements that have been announced as well. Uh, and I think. It, again, for me, if that is talked about more from the president and uh, from the White House, uh, it sheds light on the great things being done. People are surprised when I talk about it. And they go, that stuff is actually happening. Yeah. Well, let me first say, Roland, thank you so much for talking about it. Thank you so much for being that voice to lay out exactly what's happening uh, here in the administration to benefit uh, communities uh, like ours, and so certainly thank you for for doing that. And I know you've been uh, you've been you've been pretty much a champion on on the work that's being done uh, at the Department of, of Justice in their Civil Rights Division. Look, and that's happening because of that executive order that the president signed, because this is at the directive of this president, because he wants to make sure that communities uh, feel safe and that and that um, and that law enforcement are held accountable. And that is incredibly important. Look, we will talk more about this. Obviously, uh, we have to. There's so much going on, as you know, in this in the world, uh, and not just obviously in the country, but in the world that the president has to speak to. And certainly we will do that to highlight that work because it's important to the communities to know what's going on and how seriously we have taken that, especially one of the reasons we the president was a was certainly elected. But I'm so glad that you just lay that out because it is true. It is what DOJ is doing through the Civil Rights Division. They are making sure that that executive order is that the president signed is being is being uh, put into action, uh, if you will. And we'll talk more about that. There's so much to talk about. There's so much. Uh, there's so much accomplishments that we have made, whether it's the economy, whether it's it's through DOJ, whether it's you know housing, and because those are the things that the American people wanted us to see and continue to fight for freedoms. Obviously, we saw that in the last election, most recent election, and obviously in the one in 2022, how important it is to protect uh, our freedoms. And so all of these things are important uh, items and issues that we definitely will continue to speak to and lift up in, in what we've been able to do. Last question for you. Um, obviously, uh, you've got holiday season coming up, and really, once January hits, uh, we're operating in election season. Uh, are we going to see the president uh, doing uh, town hall discussions across the country, going into black communities, uh, not not just talking about these things, but also having listening sessions uh, with voters? Uh, because you know, you know, polls certainly show lots of angst. Numbers have dropped significantly uh, among African Americans. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I've consistently said that really the first six, seven months of the, of the year has to be sort of uh, an, an education and enlightenment uh, period as opposed to just saying, hey, vote. That's going to be critical. Because, again, the, the phrase when you don't know, you don't know uh, <laughs> is, is a huge part of this. And a lot of people just don't know about a lot of stuff that you're laying out. Yeah, no, you're a thousand percent right, Roland. Look, I got to be careful. Can't talk about 2024 Hatch Act. I can't do that. But what I will say to you, Roland, is this is a president that loves to get out there and speak directly to the American people. Uh, this is this is a, a place that he thrives and loves and enjoys to do that. Listen to the American people talk about our accomplishments. So obviously he's always looking forward to doing that. When we get into the next year, this is something that he's going to continue to do. Talk to directly to the American people about the accomplishments that we've been able to make with Democrats in Congress. Uh, and there's been a lot, as you just laid out. There's been historic 
pieces of legislation that have been passed that is going to change the lives of Americans. They're going to change the lives of Americans that have been left behind. That is going to either, whether it's the infrastructure, whether it is buildings and tunnels and you know broadband, what's going on in your own community uh, with the infrastructure, whether it's health healthcare, you know, lowering costs for American people, uh, whether it is making sure the economy is working for you and doesn't leave you behind. All of those things are critical, whether it is uh, what we're doing at DOJ through the Civil Rights uh, Division, as you just mentioned. There is so much to talk about. And let's not forget, fighting to protect people's freedom, making sure that women have the right to make decisions on their own body without politicians getting involved in a way that is completely inappropriate, fighting for democracy. All of those things, this is some, all of those things that I just laid out. And let's not forget education system, student loans, uh, making sure that we're giving people a little bit of breathing room, lowering costs, all of those things that the president's going to get out there, talk about, speak directly to the American people, and also listen, right? Listen to what it is that people want to hear and want us to see uh, see us continuing to do. All right. Kareem, we really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Happy holidays. Likewise. All right, folks, when we come back, I will talk with director George Wolf about his movie on Netflix, Rushton. It is about the great civil rights leader, Bayard Rustin. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037- 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from LA. And this is The Culture. The Culture is a two way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together. So let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Big famous Bob Russell. In 41, you called for a large-scale march. The time has come for another. No bad. I can handle all the grunt work. Rally the young. We are going to put together the largest peaceful protest made up of angelic troublemakers such as yourself. My friend, Dr. Martin Luther King, will be joining us. How many bodies did it take to surround the White House? How many? Sorry, I thought that was a setup for a joke. You literally want me to yes. find out? <laughs> when it comes to the old God, I'm considered a pariah. Every person at this table will be in the line of fire because of him. Everyone's so obsessed with what I'm doing and with whom. How can you preach salvation and not want to save yourself? Every day, we surrender that which makes us different. I can't surrender my differences. The world won't let me. The day of your march, the entire DC police force has been mobilized. What they really want to destroy is all of us coming together and demanding this country change. I remember saying that this Rustin fella is a little crazy. Only later did I fully comprehend that the little didn't even come close. We intend to go there not by the thousands, but by the hundreds of thousands. Yes! We are committed to altering the trajectory of this country towards freedom. That's what's on the line. Nothing less. 
Lord, I hope and pray they come today. Welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Byron Rustin is a name many people don't know about, but he was one of the co-conveners of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in August of 1963. He also played a huge role in getting Dr. King to embrace nonviolence, yet he's often been forgotten largely because we often focus on only a handful of people, including Dr. King, also because he was gay. George Wolf directs a new movie about him. It's called Rushton. It airs on Netflix. And I got a chance to sit down with George recently in Washington, D.C. George, how's it going? Good. How's it going with you? Uh, going great. Let's talk about uh, this movie. For a lot of people, it's Byron Rushton, uh, not Baird. Uh, many people don't really know his story. Um, and I think what really stands out the most, why I believe the film is critically important, is because we only know four or five people from the Civil Rights Movement. Yes. He was a huge figure to me in many ways, like Ella Baker. Yes. Major figure, too many people don't know. Yes, yes, yes. Well, it's, it, but it, it's, that's frequently the case. History is sort of, history is very limited in its understanding of how movements happen. Right. How it takes all different kinds of forces working toward the same goal and and some get celebrated and some don't. But also media plays a role in that in terms of who they frame as the leader, as the voice, without realizing, no, there were multiple people Absolutely. who played huge roles. Absolutely, and also it's like, you know, at, at very early on, as it states in the film, the, or, the organizers of the march decided that only those people who were the heads of organizations could speak. Only the male heads. And only the male. But, but was a, were there any women heads? There was, you know there, there was a pre-program exactly. where the women spoke. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and you know, there, you know, and there were all these people like Ella Baker, like Diane Nash, like, like Joanne Robinson, all these people who were contributing and who were at the groundwork, but that 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 was the order of the day because well, a lot of them were were, were the preachers of the of the churches, right. and that's how it worked. Also, um, I mean, obviously, you're focusing on a, a moment in yes. time, uh, but I think the, the to really study uh, a Rustin, how he he connected with multiple periods absolutely over his life, yes. and so you, I think, one of the biggest mistakes we make is we sort of confine people solely to those 13 years of the black freedom movement. Mm -hmm. And he goes, be, it, it, so his story goes beyond that. It was before the black freedom movement, then also the activism and movement organize, organizing afterward. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I was very interested in, in, I was very interested in 1963 because it's a fascinating time, you know, you know, um, you know, in, in, in terms of the, the you know, Passive resistance had been the order of the day, but after, you know, but, but it had been many, many years since Brown versus Board of Education and right. the violence, you know, you know, what's his face, um, Bull Connor turned the hosing, hosing, hosing the, the, the young children there, you know, Becker Evers uh, getting killed, all these dynamics that were happening and it was calling into question how how long are we going to stay committed to nonviolence? SNCC was an integrated organization right. that was about to change. CORE was about to change into CORE East. All these all these dynamics were happening, and even though you had this glorious march that, that which, which brought in two hundred fifty thousand people, two to three weeks later, the four little girls got killed. So it just seemed like this really really fascinating time to focus in on. On, 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 on where America was, right. where Bayard was, you know, the fact that the Kennedys and J. Edgar Hoover were focusing in on trying to humiliate him so as, excuse me, to stop the march, all of those dynamics seem to be a prime example of, 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 of what 1963 was about, what Bayard was about, and what this world was well, about. Well, I think, uh, I mean, again, uh, I sort of, I use the phrase in my... MLK Day speeches. I'm tired of him being sort of this civil rights bobblehead. And so we look at these events and go, ooh, the 63 March in Washington. First of all, you need to add for jobs and freedom. But to really understand, when you talk about that backstory, how this was beyond radical. 
You're talking about toning down John Lewis's speech, the fear of them, the fear of riots. The, what Philip Randolph said with the FDR, now all of a sudden comes in and go, wait a minute, this thing is real. This is a massive deal. So I think a lot of people don't understand how radical this march was. It yeah. wasn't just a day in the park. No, I agree with you. That's a miniseries. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but this again, is a movie. No, no, you know no, 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 no. But, but again, even by, 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 with your focus on it, it's getting people to understand this wasn't just a gathering. Yeah, exactly. This was no, a this was a major thing that shifted absolutely uh, and actually scared white folks in this country. Exactly. Well, yeah, I well, I think that's embodied. I think that's embodied. And and, and of course, there there's you know we, we, one one movie about Bayard Russell doesn't mean there can't be ten. Right. Um, when I talked to Reggie Hutlin when he did Marshall, he sort of uh, explained he, he, his vision was he wanted him to sort of be like, like the John Wayne character. So when I got off the elevator and so I see this photo uh, of Coleman uh, in, uh, as, as Byron Rustin, I was struck by it because it reminded me of that one. Uh, because you're centering him. A lot of times folks want to add other different pieces. Talk about why that was so critical to center him. Well, because he was such a crucial organizing brain, and and had and was so significant, and and was connected to so many people, and nobody or a finite number of people know his name, know that he existed, and and that frequently. We we focus in on one hero, and and I was just very I'm I'm very fascinated by even though I don't think this completely applies ordinary people doing extraordinary Absolutely. things. Absolutely, but I also think that he was extraordinary. So yeah. as an extraordinary person doing an extraordinary thing, and history said you don't exist anymore. And so at different times, I felt myself very protective of making sure that he didn't get overshadowed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by other people who are more famous and more significant right. in terms of how the history is told. It's just expanding the expanding the lens, if you will, so that more people are, are included, so that uh, Dr. Anna Arnold Hedgeman, I knew nothing about, you know, and so including her, having having a few scenes with Ella Baker, you know, there's so many people, Claudette Clovid, you mm -hmm. know, all these people right. were just ridiculously phenomenal right. and powerful so as, as so expanding the fabric and the texture as much as I possibly could and then there are more more movies need to be made and then more and then more last question for you on that on that note I have numerous arguments with people when movies from that era or even slavery movies um, are produced and people say Man, I'm sick of that uh, we, we, we need to stop seeing those stories and I think Part of the deal is we have to now look at a Rustin and stop looking at this as another civil rights movie. No, no, no. These are black superheroes. Absolutely. And so I think in, in this whole world of the Avengers and Marvel and DC, we have to say, no, 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 no. Uh, the character will play the emancipation. No, that's a superhero. We, I think we have to start looking at our historical figures in a much different way, not just, oh, that's a civil rights movie or a slavery movie. Well, also, you don't get to say, oh, that's just another civil rights movie unless there's one that comes out every week. <laughs> that isn't the case. Which, if it does, that's great. Exactly. Because we get a million stories exactly, to tell. Go exactly. Ahead. But that hasn't happened. Right. So, so you don't. So, no one gets to say, "Oh, it's another one." No, no. They, they need. You know, this is. It, it's every time one comes out it needs to be celebrated. Hopefully, it's good and worthy of the celebration because it's adding to the stories and it's adding to the figures that we should know who we, we, we who there are things that they can teach us things that can empower us and and it's a response to when somebody's trying to erase your history celebrate your history i'm sound like a baptist preacher i'm gonna close with this one uh, i ask book authors this question all the time what was the one wow moment doing the research for them what was your wow moment was it an individual where you went wow i didn't even know about this person was there something else um, connected to this film? Yeah. Um, when you do your research, could it be I think it was uh, Dr. Anna Arnold Hedgeman and her father saying to her from the time she was a little girl, what have you done today to make yourself useful? 
that expectation, I think, is phenomenal. Saying to her every single day, not what have you done this month, what have you done today, today. to make yourself useful? That, 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 that expectation placed on a child is a monumental, extraordinary thing. And I just found it to be so moving and so powerful and, 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 and in, encouraging and instilling that sense of responsibility, that sense of, of, of you are capable of doing extraordinary things, therefore what have you done today that is extraordinary. That I found very moving. George Wolf, appreciate it. Thank you. All right, folks, when we come back, I will talk with Coleman Domingo, who stars as Bard Rushton in the Netflix movie, Rushton. Folks, you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered here on the Black Star Network. Don't forget to support us in what we do. First, you're watching right now on YouTube. Hit that like button, folks. We want to be, have more than 1,000 likes on the show. Also, support us in what we do. Please join our Brain of Funk fan club. Your dollars make it possible for us to do what we do. Send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Don't forget to also download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Be sure to get a fear how the Brownie of America is making white folks lose their minds. We'll be right back. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. An angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Folks, he finally gets his starring role, Coleman Domingo, who has starred in so many uh, different movies over the years, Selma, also The Birth of a Nation. Well, he played character actor, supporting role, this time in the Netflix movie Rushton. He is the lead. He's playing Byron Rushton, the civil rights icon, largely forgotten in history, uh, many say because he was a gay man. Coleman Domingo, he himself, is an out black gay man. And we talk about the importance of playing this huge, huge character and what it means to Coleman personally. Here's our conversation recently in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. All right, Coleman, what's happening? How you doing? Strike over, oh, you can get to talk now. I get, I get, to, <laughs> I get to talk, freedom. Absolutely, yes, yeah. absolutely. Man. Um, let's talk about this film. So. Long career, but you now are the centerpiece. You now are the main character. You have to carry this whole film. Uh, talk about that feeling, being the guy. 
being the guy. Just your name was on the poster. Yeah, that. <laughs> Ain't nobody else's name. Yeah. Not in the background. It's you. Yeah. Um, it feels like um, it feels like a career achievement, and it feels like a long, a long beautiful road, you know. And it's it's that name. There's so many other names with me that have made that happen, especially for this film in particular. To leave this film has been something that I'll, I'll never forget for the rest of my career, because um, there was a great responsibility, you know, to tell the story of this man and also to be sort of the soul of the production and knowing that the production moves with you in the center and how are you gonna lead it. And I've watched, you know, as a supporting actor for many years, how people, whether they lead or not lead. And I knew I could make an impact and make sure that everyone understood the mission every single day of what we were doing, what we were tasked to do, which was not only to tell Byron Rustin's story, but to tell Ella Baker's story, to tell a Philip Randolph's story, you know, stories of all these people who've been marginalized in the history books. And you're like, hey, this is our opportunity. And so that was the charge every single day. So when people came in, you know, if they had a couple days on set, I'm like, you're coming into a different set. You're coming into the set that I lead, which is led with love and interrogation and a, a fierce work ethic. And that means every single background, every single transpo worker, everybody w w was tasked to, you know, to say, hey, this is the way we're doing it. We're doing it differently this time. Mm -hmm. And so I, I didn't mind to shoulder that responsibility and I felt like I was ready for it. Um, when Chad would play Thurgood Marshall, a lot of hmm. people were like, Reggie, what are you doing? He, he ain't light skinned like Thurgood. Yeah. Uh, when Brian Cranston played uh, a paraplegic in the movie, Mm -hmm. Folks like, what are y'all doing? Why couldn't you cast someone? How important was it for a African American gay man to play this character? Because he didn't hide, he didn't run from it, but he had to battle within the movement, outside of the movement, and it wasn't he wasn't solely defined by him being gay, but he, he was clear. This is who I am. Yeah, the the most wonderful thing about the casting of Rustin uh, with me is that we are very, there's a lot of similarities just in terms of where we, where I pull from. You know, I'm an openly gay man in this industry. And I think the beautiful thing is I don't think it's usually done in a way. I've, I don't know why that has been. But also I think that sometimes people can't discern the difference, you know, and I think that hopefully people can see the work and the detail and the nuance that goes into building a character and crafting a role to know that it's like, it's not just Coleman playing it because there's a lot of things in my background in this way, but it's actually like a crafted character. But it is important because I think there are things that I know I could pull from or I have access to mm -hmm. that is not... You don't have to ask somebody else. I don't have to ask anybody else. It's my own experience in the world. We're both from, there are many similarities between me and Byron Rustin. Like being from Pennsylvania, you know, I have a lot of nieces and nephews going to go Quaker school, so I understand the practices of, you know, Quaker philosophy. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, we're both left handed, whatever, whatever it is. But also, Byron was. Yeah, left handed. Yeah, yeah, left handed. <laughs> but also, Byron was so just such an original in the world. You know, there was, there was no brother like him. <laughs> you know what I mean? So the idea for that to exist at the time when he existed, is, is remarkable. And so the idea that, that I get to play in that with him, because I feel like I am on the shoulders of, of Byatt Rustin in every single way. Everything that Byatt represented, I, here I am in my own industry, mm -hmm. you know, trying to make some, um, some changes. When did you first learn about him? I first learned about him, I would say about, I wanna get this right, probably junior year in college, mm -hmm. when I joined the African American Student Union. And at some point, I, whenever we were talking about something, by Russin's name came up. Oh, Quaker. Oh, from Pennsylvania. Oh, queer. And the architect of the March on Washington? Wait a minute. How come I don't know this? And then, of course, you have to rethink what you've learned in your history classes. Right. <laughs> well, well, but even before yeah. 63, the role that he played in centering oh, Dr. Yes. King on nonviolence. Yes. Yeah, he inspired Dr. King with his uh, practices of passive resistance. You know, he, he inspired him, you know, with the teachings of, of Gandhi. So in many ways, I, this may be a very strong statement, but I, would Martin Luther King be Martin Luther King without Byron Rustin? Because I think he influenced him a lot. And they had this very deep friendship in many ways. And there were people who like shared um, ideology and, and argued and questioned together. You know well, I, mean? I, don't th I think it goes beyond King or, and even Rustin. You mentioned Ella Baker earlier. Mm -hmm. I think that 
okay, as somebody who lives and breathes news and social movements and politics, I get it. I study these people all the time. Yeah. But the reality is you only hear four or five names. Uh, you only heard about the big six, yeah. the big six civil rights leaders. But if you look at an Ella Baker, you're talking about somebody who, who goes from movements in New York to, uh, to SCLC, mm-hmm. NAACP, uh, to SNCC, and beyond. Uh, Rushton, if you talk about after 63, you go to 64. You can even uh, go back to the war resistors. Uh, right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, him, him going to prison, uh, being a conscientious objector, yeah. all of that. And so I think, I think part of it, even for a lot of African Americans, is that we have allowed others to define who our heroes are. Hmm. And we have to then go, wait a minute, hold up. It's more than just four or five people. Right. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of ordinary people. Right? No one was trying to walk into history books. They were just trying to do what was in front of them, right? <laughs> you, you know, and just, like, make a difference. And there were a lot of people. That's what I'm always telling people. I'm like, no, the thing that I think is so impactful about Rustin, because you see a lot of these young people who are now, you know, you know congressmen and uh, congressmen mm-hmm. and things like mm-hmm. that. These people were, they were 19, 20 years old out there doing the work. And these people were not 50, 60 and, then. And, no, right. and, and nobody knows their names. You're like, right. no, they actually <laughs> were a part of this movement. Yep. And then, but then you have these superstars. You will just attach your name to Martin Luther King, but you're like, King at the speech, to be honest, he was just one of the speakers. Right. He, he was, <laughs> right? He right. was just one of many speakers. Right. You know, it's just like, but that, that it was his time and it was that alchemy that just like lit him up right then. That's when he became the superstar that he is. You mentioned superstar. Uh, when I interviewed Richard Roundtree, hmm. uh, God rest his soul, uh, I said, Richard, you were a black superhero. A lot of people complain about civil rights movies, slavery movies, we're tired of seeing those movies. I disagree. I think the problem is, I think we have to have a reprogramming of black America. Hmm. We have to look at figures like Rushton, um, the role that, um, that uh, Will Smith played in Emancipation mm-hmm. as our superheroes. Hmm. These are people who not just survive, odds. but thrive. Odds. Exactly. They are superheroes. And I-, I appreciate Black Panther. I appreciate the Marvel characters, but these were real-life superheroes. I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's how impactful would that be to young um, black and brown kids? That would be phenomenal. They believe that they can actually... They don't have to be in Wakanda. They can actually do something here right. and actually make a difference in their communities and their world. It's actually real. You can touch it. You know who that person was. They came from the same neighborhood. You name it. I think you're absolutely right. Last question for you. For you, um, I was asked this of book authors and others. What was a wow moment when they were researching and writing the book? So for you, playing this character, was there a moment when your research and your study uh, where you went? Wow, I had no idea. I think the wow comes in like when when I start researching and looking at Rustin, even in high school. Just first of all, he was an athlete, he was an all-star athlete, but also he played the lute, and then he sang. I mean, who is this brother? (laughs) He's a Quaker. You're like, there's so many things. You're like, what? What is that person? What is that walking this earth? and then made sure that his life was of service in every single way. I, that was the wow for me. Like, how did it, like, where did that come from? That confidence as mm-hmm. a young person, as 15, 16 years old, to, to stage a protest, you know, in, 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 the, uh, in the cafeteria for, for better food. Right. Well, and for me, it's always like, where does that come then from? Then a protest in, in the prison. Exactly, in the, in the prison, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But he, he, was, he, he, was, he, he, was, he was a moving on buses long before Rosa Parks. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Because he was like, no, I had, this is not right, and I want to right or wrong. But where does that come from? That's the wow for me. Like, where does that come from? Absolutely. And, and where can I get some of that? Absolutely. You can keep the hair? <laughs> <laughs> That hair went. I actually took that hair off last day. I couldn't. I, could, I had to let go of it. Had to let, had to shed that hair. Like I'll keep the rest of Rustin, but not the hair. <laughs> but I still have the teeth. I have to teeth at home. Oh, okay. You know, maybe I'll bust them out on a Halloween or something. <laughs> there like that. you go. <laughs> exactly. Appreciate it, Carmen. Thank you. Thanks Roman. so much. So good to see, indeed, so good to see you, man. Appreciate good it. Good to see you, folks. Don't forget Rustin airing on Netflix. All right. When we come back, I talk with the director of. The 24th, the movie came out three years ago, but it details the story of more than 100 black soldiers who were court-martialed after a race riot in Houston in 1917. It is a stunning story, one you likely did not know about, but you should watch now. 
You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Grow your business or career with Grow with Google's wide range of online courses, digital training, and tools. Gain in-demand job skills with flexible online training programs designed to put you on the fast track to jobs in high growth fields. No experience is necessary. Learn at your own pace. Complete the online certificate program on your own terms. Stand out to employers, get on a path to in-demand jobs, and connect with top employers who are currently hiring. Take one professional career certificate program or all six. Earn a Google career certificate to prepare for a job in a high growth field like data analytics, project management, UX design, cybersecurity, and more. All professional career certificate programs must be completed by December 31st, 2024. Scan the QR code to complete the application. There are 1,000 scholarships available. Grow with Google and J. Hood and Associates. Be job ready and qualify for in-demand jobs. When the 24th came out three years ago, I didn't even know about this movie. I didn't know about the story. It wasn't until I was actually reading a, a book uh, from Will Haygood on the confirmation hearing of Thurgood Marshall that I found out about the 24th Regiment and what happened in Houston. Well, Kevin Wilmot is the director. Uh, and when the U.S. Army recently uh, overturned their, the convictions of the 110 black soldiers involved, 19 were executed, we, uh, and the ceremony in Houston on Roland Martin Unfiltered. And so I caught up with Kevin. We talked about that event, talked about the movie, and why this history is so important to our people. Uh, 24th Infantry. This is Texas. And we have a great opportunity here. A legacy, if proven worthy, will carry us all the way to the shores of France. Yeah! Things are a little different down here in the South. I will expect you men to obey the racial code. Yes, sir. Get back with the others. Just go ahead and drive this machine. Officer Cross. This is a white man's world. Every man here has got a lit fuse. Jim Crow's the law. Respect. What are we gonna do? The police brutalize us, sir. All we want is to be treated as soldiers. As military police, you are to ensure order of the men of the 24th Infantry only. Drop the knife. Back up! I was robbed of my honor. You get out of here before they take yours, too. The general can get the 24th in the fight. He's never going to do that. What do we do, sir? We have to be here. We have a problem. We're gonna take our country back. Law run this town. There's a militia on the way. Are they? Which way did they go? <laughs> Keep pushing people down. <laughs> Sooner or later, they rise up. Fire! Can you identify any of the leaders of the mutiny? When I aim the gun, I saw a man. He didn't see one back.
A lot of you may not even know that movie came out. It came out during COVID. I didn't know. Uh, but joining me right now is the director, Kevin Wilmot uh, of the 24th. Uh, Kevin, glad to have you here. Praise the Lord for Instagram. Uh, I was <laughs> talking to Michael T. Williamson, and he was telling me about it. And so then I go to I go to Instagram, and I'm trying to find you. And uh, I sent you a DM, and uh, I didn't hear back. But then I saw a photo of you and Spike Lee uh, on your Instagram page. So I hit Spike. Spike sent me your number, uh, and boom, you are here. So uh, I am so glad uh, to have you. Uh, this, you know, this, 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 I'm a native of Houston and had no idea about this story. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the American problem, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of what we do. You know, we, uh, we hide this, we hide the, uh, the real history from the public. Uh, you know, I, I heard a lot of people talk about how Texas teaches Texas history, but this part of Texas history has never been, has never been taught. In, fa in fact, it is a state requirement in the seventh grade that you take Texas history. And, and Kevin, the book is literally this thick. Wow. That's how thick the book. I mean, I, I mean, it is a massive book. Uh, and so you're absolutely right. And this was not in that thick ass book. You know, and, and what's what's amazing, Rolling, and thank you so much for having me on the show. I really have always been a big fan. Um, the the thing about this 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 riot, as they called it, um, this ended up being the largest murder trial in American history. I mean, wow. that's how that's how I that's how I learned about it. It was it was a history book I was reading twenty years ago. Uh, and they had us there's only one photograph of the trial. And sixty-four Buffalo soldiers on trial at one time, and and the and the and the inscribed caption was the largest murder trial in American history. And I had never, I'm a history geek. I had never heard anything about it, uh, and that's what you know started me on my quest to really make this movie. It took me twenty years, but we finally got there. And then, of course, COVID kind of kind of hides hides the movie from people a bit, but uh, at least it's out there. Yeah, because uh, and, and so so what happened was and you're right. This is the photo right here. Uh, this is from the archives at Prairie View a and University. Uh, this is the photo uh, right here uh, of them being on trial. And, and, and Kevin, um, it, it was interesting because so the Wall Street Journal had an article yesterday uh, talking about this decision and that there was going to be this ceremony in Houston. Uh, I saw that, and, and here's what's crazy. I rarely read the Wall Street Journal on weekends. I've got, I've got subscriptions to the New York Times, Washington Post, and I just, what the hell, all right, let me take a look at it. And then I see this story, uh, I immediately email someone at the Pentagon. I'm like, hey, get me somebody from the Army. Also, this is gonna be live streamed. So they sent me the link, and then that's what I started, you know, going down that path, and then all of a sudden, uh, and then I saw the movie, so then I'm looking on, where can I find it? I saw it was on Tubi and Prime Video, went to Prime Video, watched the whole movie last night, absolutely uh, amazing. Uh, and it, it's, it's just another example, another example, and this is also four years before Tulsa, the Tulsa right. race uh, massacre. Uh, right. and, and the thing is, uh, when we look at, the, look, look at this, 19 brothers executed. Uh, placed in unmarked graves, but their names were placed on paper inside of uh, glass bottles uh, in the caskets. Uh, and um, when you read this account of how the Army did no real investigation, and it was pretty much, oh, uh, they black, they're guilty. Yeah, I mean, I, there there was kind of one book that I was able to find on it, and and there's you know twenty years ago there was not much of anything, and then I I actually read a lot of the newspaper accounts um, from the time from the from Houston at that time from uh, the Houston I think it's called Houston Post, uh, and they were you know com you know you could just read the bias between it between the lines. Yep. Uh, they, they 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 did not receive anything close to a fair trial. Uh, but more, more than anything, what we try to show in the movie, as you know, is is they were they were brutal, brutalized. I mean, they sent 700 soldiers, black soldiers to Houston in 1917. These guys had been uh, some of them had fought in the in the Philippine insurrection campaign. Some of them had fought with Teddy Roosevelt on San Juan Hill. So these guys were a lot of them were used to being treated uh, with some degree of dignity. 
and uh, and 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 had been treated really kind of as you know like soldiers are supposed to be treated. And so you know they they show up in Houston and 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 Houston just is paranoid of of them in, in, in totally. And and in and Houston the Houston police you know there's that old song the Midnight Special. And in that song, they, they talk about Houston and, and they talk about the police in Houston specifically. And uh, and that, that's an old blues song from from Lead Billy back in the days. And 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 he, the Houston police had a had a notorious, you know, record of, of brutalizing everybody, but specifically black people and Mexicans. And and so when the, when these 700 black soldiers show up, they just they just unleashed holy hell on them. Well, and well, well, all across the country, white folks could not stand black men with guns in their hands, uh, even though they had that uniform uh, on. Um, and, you know, uh, we can uh, and, and it was crazy. I mean, his so my dad has texted me. He said uh, he said he'd been lo- long knew about Camp Logan. And here's what's crazy. What is now what is now Memorial Park in Houston? Is where Camp Logan was. And again, I, I, I'm like you. I love history. No idea. That's why it was called Memorial Park. Uh, there, there's a, uh, they, they play the PGA uh, golf tour there. I played there numerous times. Not one time. As a matter of fact, when I go, matter of fact, I'm going to you know, hit the mayor to find out. I mean, is, is there a marker? Is there anything there that explains uh, that? I've, I've been to Memorial Park numerous times and never knew that that was the site of Camp Logan. I don't think there's. I don't think there's anything. Of, there might be some small thing, but I don't think anything of significance is there, from, from what I understand. Uh, no, it's it's been a, a hidden piece of American history for for far too long. This is this is an amazing day. I mean, I have to be honest with you. I, I never thought they would do it. You know, I mean, you, one of the things that you often would hear about this uh, this case is that this is the first time of all the um, civil unrest cases in American history. Uh, this is the first time more whites died than blacks, uh, and the only time. And wow! Uh, and yeah, and and it was because these men, these were trained soldiers, and these guys had been brutalized and brutalized and brutalized. They finally snapped; they couldn't take any more. You know, 150 black soldiers march on Houston, Texas, in full combat gear, and 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 they went specifically went after the police. But you know, you got to remember this is before. Gandhi. This is before the civil rights movement. This is before, you know, this is before anything could have taught them how to respond in any other way. I mean, these are soldiers, and 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 they they're used to fighting, and they had been, they had fought overseas for people's rights, but you know, could not fight at home for their own rights. And one of the things they kept saying was that you know they they desperately wanted to fight in World War One in France, uh, but they were never sent. See, and that's what people don't understand. I mean, we just had Veterans Day on Sunday. And the reality is, these were black men who could not have rights in this country, but were willing to fight for this country in order to preserve the rights that they could not access. The idea was always that if we fight overseas and and show our loyalty and show our patriotism, maybe they'll give us this right, our rights back. Well, the black newspapers led, it's called the Double V Campaign, Victory at Home and Victory Abroad, the Pittsburgh Curry or Chicago Defender, uh, all of them. Uh, and, and also, if people read Ethan um, McK- uh, McKelly's book on the Chicago Defender, this country uh, could not stand that black newspapers like the Chicago Defender were writing about racism experienced uh, by the soldiers, and they threatened the black newspapers with treason to try them for treason they said because they were stirring up uh, dissension among the troops and they were they were actually writing about the racism that black troops were facing in the military. <laughs> I mean, it's it's so it's so, it, it's so unbelievable that 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 this is our, our, our life and our history. And and and, um, you know, and, and but but it is. And 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 it's so important that uh, we tell these stories. I mean, you know, one of the things I think that we we see now is that they're trying to make these stories go away and and they're trying to to erase these these things from history and as we know about the holocaust and all the other horrible things in in life it's important to remember the holocaust that happened here as well 
and it's important. And there's and just as this Tulsa and Houston, there there were you know as you know, Roland, just there's countless numbers of these incidents all over the country, and 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 you know it's very hard to get a movie made about them. Uh, you know, but it's important that black people, black audiences specifically, um, you know, watch these movies and embrace these movies and tell others about these movies. Because, you know, Hollywood, you know, never has wanted to tell this side of our history. And so it's hard to get a movie like this made. And uh, it's but it's it's really important because obviously, you know, the Republican Party, and a lot of other folks, they, they don't want us to they don't want to hear about this. They don't want their kids to know about it. They don't want. They don't want to know about American history. This is more than anything. This is American history. And 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 it's, uh, you know, it's being attacked. We're talking about uh, the historic decision by the United States Army to vacate uh, the convictions of 110 black soldiers involved uh, in a race riot in Houston in 1970. There was a ceremony today in Houston uh, announcing this decision and, al and also announcing the steps that uh, they are taking to, one, provide benefits to the descendants uh, of these soldiers. We're talking with Kevin Wilmot. He is the director of the movie, The 24th, uh, and he joins us right now. And it, Kevin, it's interesting. I'm, so during the break. Uh, first of all, I'm sitting there texting the mayor of Houston right now, uh, my alpha brother, uh, about this here. But I, I went to the uh, website of the Memorial Park Conservancy, uh, and they're the ones. Uh, and so I'm looking here, and I'm looking under history. Uh, and as I'm going under here, so th this is literally what it says. It says, uh, the park was to be named to honor the soldiers who fought in World War I and trained in Camp Logan, today known as Memorial Park. Camp Logan was one of a handful of training camps established to train and convert members of the National Guard to become U.S. military service members. So first of all, I'm, I'm, was Camp Logan there to train black soldiers or all soldiers? They, they trained all soldiers. Okay. But but, you know, they had a black, you know, had a black section. Gotcha. Uh, and obviously, uh, nowhere in here is there any mention uh, of what took place. Uh, and it looks like we may have lost Kevin there. Let me know we have him back. Uh, th there we go. There we go. Okay. So there's no, nowhere in here is there any mention of what took place uh, in 1917. Matter of fact, uh, let's see here. Uh, there is a timeline here. Um, uh, th this is the extent of it. Camp Logan, 1917. The United States enters the First World War and the War Department leases 7,600 acres of forested land on Buffalo Bayou to establish a training base named Camp Logan. The camp trains 70,000 soldiers, housing 30,000 at any given time and is a social center of Houston. Nearly 1,000 Camp Logan soldiers lose their lives during the war and over 6,200 are wounded. There are stories of heroism and bravery associated with Camp Logan. Among them, the 370th Regiment, after training at Camp Logan, Logan go on to serve with the French military and become the most decorated in all of World War I. There are also stories of tragedy associated with the camp, including the Houston Mutiny and Riot, which took place on the night of August 23rd, 1917. Kevin, that's it. That's all you get. That's all you get, right? That, that's it. Like... <laughs> Ain't, but, uh, b uh, b black ain't mentioned, but but you also know this called the Houston Mutiny and Riot, not race riot, but just go ahead. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's the, that's the deal, and and you know, think I mean that's what makes this day so great because you know, as someone who's you know been trying to tell the story for a very long time, and and having to read that kind of stuff for years and years and years. And and the fact that they've done such a great job in, in erasing this from our history books uh, and our memory, our, our national memory. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's it's just a really profound thing that these men are finally being honored. And, and you gotta remember these Buffalo soldiers, the 24th specifically, you know, they fought they fought in they fought in in, in uh you know the Spanish American War. They went up San Juan Hill with Teddy Roosevelt. They fought in the Philippine insurrection. And and most people don't know anything about the Philippine insurrection. This happened right after uh San Juan Hill and and the fight with Cuba. Uh but th that's the really the first Vietnam. That's really the first Vietnam. 
and 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 these guys are fighting. They they, they fought. They fought. Uh, they sent some of these guys in China. They had fought Pancho Villa in New Mexico. Uh, they have been. They have been all over the place. And and these guys had. These men had. Um, you know, had had really kind of you know gained a certain dignity and respect that 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 most black men in America had not achieved because of of you know of, of you know, the horrors of, of segregation, Jim Crow. So so these guys had they were they were they were real they, they were real American citizens, and they they saw themselves as equal citizens, and and that's why I believe that's why they. That's why. That's why they they rebelled. Uh, yeah, because- they were, I mean, and look, I mean, these were the, look. Th- th- these are black men wearing these uniforms. And speaking of that, I, I was very curious because uh, I'm, when I'm watching the movie, I'm always interested in terms of you know what was what actually happened. So so the the, the end of in the movie, the end of the trial. And my panel, get ready. I'm going to get y'all for questions. The end of the movie was the end of the trial. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. When they were saying, uh, I am a man, um, was that um, was that written into the was that actually testimony from the trial? I, I added that my Tra- Trey Byers and myself, we, we wrote the script together. Uh, we added that. But, uh, you know, but I felt we felt that that's that's what was going on inside of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, all the reason all the reason I asked the question is because obviously the I am a man signs were, were so visible in, by, by the um, uh, by the sanitation workers in Memphis in 1968. And I was yes. curious if, if they were actually saying that as early as 1917. But but you're absolutely right that that was the through line uh, through so many of these instances where the, where black men were saying, yeah, I'm a man. Treat me like a man. Yes. And, 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 you know, and, and they really, you know, I mean, they really, you know, had to, um, they really tried their best to, to hold it together. I mean, they really, really, really tried their best to hold it together, but there were two racist, horribly, horribly racist cops specifically, uh, that, that targeted them and, and just made their life holy hell. And, and so, you know, you got to remember these guys are seeing, uh, guys in their, in their company, uh, coming home, they'd go. They'd go out to Houston for uh, to get a drink, or or go see some a friend or whatever. And they'd come home to the camp at Bloody, where they'd been beaten up by the police. And this was day after day after day after day. And eventually, as we show in the movie, uh, they they went after who was uh, Corporal Baltimore. We we call him uh, we call him Boston in the film Trey Byers plays in the movie. They went after Baltimore, who was. Uh, one of the real leaders of the of of, of the company, and uh, and and uh, it was an MP who was trying to keep keep things at rest, to keep things you know at peace with the with the situation there. Black MPs were not allowed to carry firearms, so when the police went after him, they started to try to kill him. Uh, he had to flee. The word got back to the the, the camp and soldiers. That uh, Boston, that Baltimore, Boston, we call him in the film, had been murdered by the police. And you got to remember, this was not long after another racial, horrible racial massacre in East St. Louis. Yep. And so, so, so the whole idea of a white mob coming and 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 murdering you was was not conjecture. I mean, this was a this was in everybody's mind, everybody's conscious, everybody's, you know, just ready to have somebody, something like that happen to them. And and so when the word got back that the mob a mob was coming to the camp <coughs> soldiers, that's uh that's what led them to uh to uh to march on the city. Men of the 24th Infantry. This is Texas. And we have a great opportunity here. A legacy, if proven worthy, will carry us all the way to the shores of France. Yes! Things are a little different down here in the South. I will expect you men to obey the racial code. Yes, sir. Get back with the others. Just go ahead and drive this machine. Officer Cross, this is a white man's world. Every man here has got a lit fuse. 
Jim Crow's the law. Respect it. What are we gonna do? The police brutalize us, sir. All we want is to be treated as soldiers. As military police, you are to ensure order of the men of the 24th Infantry only. Drop the knife. I was robbed of my honor. You get out of here before they take yours, too. General, you can get the 24th in the fight. He's never going to do that. What do we do, sir? William, I've done all I can do here. We have a problem. We're gonna take our country back. Law run this town. There's a militia on the way. Are they? Which way did they go? Pushing people down. Sooner or later, they rise up. Fire! Can you identify any of the leaders of the mutiny? When I aim the gun. I saw a man. He didn't see one back. All right, folks, so we come back on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, a one-hour conversation with former Attorney General Eric Holder, who is leading the battle to ensure our voting rights and make sure that we have proper representation in Congress and on the state level as well. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Bye bye, Papa. What's up, Geek Tony in the place to be. You got kicked out your mama's university, creator and executive producer of Fat Tuesdays, the air hip hop comedy. But right now, I'm rolling with Roland Martin, unfiltered, uncut, unplugged, and undamn believable. You hear me? All right, folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. My conversation with former Attorney General. Eric Holder. We cover a lot of stuff, including what he is doing uh, when it comes to redistricting, making sure that we have proper representation on the federal and the state level, but also why it's so critical that we as African Americans understand the power of our vote. Here he is, this exclusive conversation. All right, lots to talk about uh, here, former Attorney General Holder, but let's uh, I want to start here. The Eighth Circuit came out with a decision with regards to 
uh, Section 2. This is, look, the conservatives have been trying to get rid of the Voting Rights Act for a long time. Clarence Thomas is salivating at that opportunity. Uh, they, they, of course, the Shelby v. Holder decision gutted Section 4. Now you have this, this three-panel uh, ju- uh, group that says, oh, private groups and individuals can't sue using Section 2, even though more than nearly 200 lawsuits have been filed, nearly most of them highly successful. And so just set up for people who do not understand why these court, these court battles are so important when it comes to voting rights, especially as it relates to African-Americans. Well, I mean, I think you had a little bit of history. I mean, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is justifiably called, you know, the crown jewel of the civil rights movement. And it is the thing that really brought democracy, full democracy, to, um, to our nation. Still imperfect, but I mean, really cured a lot of the issues that we had been dealing with as a nation for many years, and in particular, uh, black people in this country. We have seen since the Shelby County decision, I guess in 2013, um, this latest decision out of the Eighth Circuit, uh, gutting at, as you said, getting at section two, uh, attempts to roll back the clock when it comes to voter protection for people of color generally, for African Americans um, more specifically. And the notion that this panel, a two to one decision, said that only the Attorney General of the United States can use Section 2 in, in bringing um, cases is totally inconsistent with the practice that has been in place since 1965, which I guess is like 58 years at this point, um, and inconsistent with what well, I did as head of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee just a few months ago when we brought a Section 2 case in Alabama that put in place for the first time uh, an opportunity, another opportunity district in Alabama so that African Americans would have the ability to select um, a congressman of their choice, likely a Democrat, likely um, a Black person. Because of racial gerrymandering, they had been prevented from doing that for generations. Uh, the Section 2 cases that we have brought in Georgia, in Louisiana, uh, all are at risk as a result of this Eighth Circuit opinion, which is inconsistent with what the Fifth Circuit said just uh, a few weeks ago. Ultimately, I suppose this will be decided by you know, the United States Supreme Court. But what bothers me is that we're taking precedents and practices that are, as I said, half a century old, and simply because of the ideological makeup or the change in the ideological makeup of these courts, either at the circuit court level or in the United States Supreme Court, we are seeing a reversal of these precedents. And that's inconsistent with how we are supposed to do things. Precedent is supposed to matter. It's not supposed to be a function of the the personnel on a particular court. It's supposed to be about the law, the facts, and precedent. And that Eighth Circuit opinion um, yesterday about uh, Section 2 can only be used, can't be used by, um, by private parties, uh, it is inconsistent with precedent and with, uh, and with practice. So what you're saying that if this ruling is allowed to go forward, your group could not have sued uh, in Alabama. Exactly right. Couldn't have sued in Alabama, couldn't have sued in Louisiana, couldn't have sued in Georgia, couldn't sue in Texas, couldn't sue in Florida. All the places where we have um, lawsuits that we have won. And and that's something that people need to understand. We brought these cases in places where, you know, the thought was, well, what are you bringing a case there? You're not going to win in in the South. Yeah, we brought them in the South and we won. And it has an impact not only in the South, but in, you know, in in parts of other parts of the country as well. But if this decision stands, it means that the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, the National Redistricting Foundation, the Component, a component of the uh, of the NDRC is out of the game, and it's all going to be on the Justice Department to uh, to bring these cases. Now, I think that Merrick Garland, you know, will do a good job as Attorney General. Doesn't have huge amounts of resources to focus on these cases. He's got a lot of stuff uh, on his place. Kristen Clark at the uh, at the has the head of civil rights. Again, another person I have great faith in. Vinita Gupta, a person I have great faith in, who's the Associate Attorney General. But they've got a lot of things um, on their plate. And as you said. I think very importantly at the beginning, the vast majority of these Section 2 cases have been brought over the years by private parties and sanctioned by the United States courts. And now two judges on the Eighth Circuit, um, again, two to one decision, said that that practice is, uh, 
is inconsistent with the language of the statute. They did. They found something that nobody else apparently had seen for the last uh, 58 years. And, and the reason, uh, and again, I need people to understand who are watching and listening. Um, uh, the reason that distinction is so crucial that, oh, only the DOJ. Well, first of all, the DOJ has only filed, I saw one story, about 15 uh, of, of these cases. That's one. But two, if you have a Republican president wh- who has that has a DOJ that is not going, that doesn't give a damn about this here, you can bank on, they're never going to file these cases. So the lawsuits that y'all filed, that, that suit was filed when Trump was president, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, so, we, so, so again, for people listening, oh, if this court ruling goes effect, oh, only the DOJ, which means that if it's likely a conservative president, they ain't filing any of these cases. No, I think that's right. I mean, it, this is it's not only an attack on precedent. The reality will be that you will then have enforcement of the Voting Rights Act, the Section Two component of the Voting Rights Act will really depend on who the attorney general is, what's the ideological makeup of that administration. And here we're talking about fundamental issues of justice, fundamental issues of voting fairness. And that should not have to rely on who the attorney general is, who the president is. There are certain things that are supposed to be immutable. And that is a commitment to making sure that there is as much equality as is possible in our voting system. You can bet that I don't know what the exact statistics are, but there were a lot more of these cases brought during the Obama years than there were during the Trump years, a lot more in the Biden years than there were in the the Trump years. Um, And that, to to, to put all of the weight uh, for the responsibility of the enforcement of Section 2 uh, on the Justice Department, inconsistent again with precedent, inconsistent with practice, and ultimately bad for, um, for the American people. We, um, I, I spend lots of time, and I've been doing this lately. I call it Civics 101, trying to um, uh, explain to people who don't live and breathe this stuff every day uh, how crucial uh, the courts are. And um, in fact, uh, on my bookshelf uh, over there, uh, I've got a, uh, a book, um, and the, uh, Jack Bass uh, is the author. Uh, and uh, I read this book when I was in college, uh, and it blew me away um, in reading this book uh, because it's called Unlikely Heroes, um, The Fifth Circuit Four. And, and, and it, it talked about Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, actually, that's, that's what it, it talked about the impact uh, of the Fifth Circuit judges and and how they were the ones who really interpreted but put in put into practice um the brown versus board of education decision and and what people have to understand and 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 i try to walk people through who say oh that's performative biden picking judge katanji brown jackson uh for the supreme court or uh rolling these black these 50 black federal judges they don't matter. And, and I just sit here and go, folks, y'all need to understand the 150 federal judges that Biden Harris has picked. If they get reelected, they probably going to pick another 200 some out judges. I uh, said so that's more than 350. It's only about 930 federal judges. And so mm-hmm. it's, it's so it's 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 hard to get people to understand why federal judges and who is president and who controls the Senate has a direct impact on the lives of black people and other people. No, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, we, you know, we have relied on the courts to, you know, further a whole range of things, you know, a woman's right to choose same sex marriage, the protection of voting rights. Um, there, there've been a whole range of things, you know, reasonable or unreasonable, um, you know, gun safety laws, Mar- all, Miranda rights, Miranda rights, exactly. <laughs> you know, all of these things For go search through and seizure. <laughs> all of these things go through, go through the courts. And so, who sits on the court, on these various courts, really matters. Now, over the course of a two-term presidency, uh, using just historical data, an average uh, president will appoint about one third of the sitting. Uh, of the sitting uh, judges in the federal system. 
And so, you know, it, this is not performative. I mean, this is substantive and has a real world impact on the lives of people in this country. And to the extent that people say, well, it doesn't matter. I say, well, wait a minute, you don't, you don't think it matters? You saw what happened with this Trump dominated um, Supreme Court. If you're a woman, uh, you don't have the same rights that, you know, perhaps a you know, young woman, you don't have the same rights um, that your that your mother did with regard to making reproductive choices. Uh, this Supreme Court has put in place an, an opinion authored by uh, Clarence Thomas, really kind of, I think, really kind of off the wall, has an off the wall view of, of the Second Amendment and, and has expanded the ability uh, of people to have in their possession you know, all kinds of um, weapons that have had such a negative impact in so many different places around um, around the country. And so who serves on the court or courts um, really matters. And that's why who is in the White House really, really matters. You know, a president will serve as, as only up to eight years. Uh, but the people that president puts on these various courts, they have lifetime tenure and they'll have the ability to shape American society for 30, 40 years. And so that uh, that is an important, important part of the calculation as to who you ought to vote for when it comes to um, you know, presidential elections. Well, I mean, let's let's go back to that huge case. And because you were the attorney general, your name is on it. Yeah. Shelby Beholder. Uh, yeah. that, I mean, that was what, 2013. Right. Uh, here we are 10 years later. It's still being referenced. The reality is for eternity, your name is going to be associated with a Supreme Court decision that when conservatives had the majority, they gutted Section 4, and immediately after that decision, Republicans all across the South began to change voting laws, voter ID, shut down polling locations. I mean, it was an all-out assault on Black people because they were angry they were angry that President Obama won. They were angry that he won North Carolina by 14,100 votes. And the Voting Rights Act was one of the most bipartisan pieces of legislation mm -hmm. since, it, since it was passed in 65. But they saw what was coming. And they said, ain't no way in hell we're going to sit here and let these black people keep voting the way they do. And after Shelby V. Holder, they went buck wild crazy changing laws. So if anybody today is ticked off that your voting location got changed or ballots ran out or whatever, and there's no uh, recourse, hmm, you can thank Shelby V. Holder and those conservative federal judges who let it go all up to the Supreme Court, and then they, and then they, they ruled Section 4 unconstitutional. That is how federal judges can impact people for decades. Now, let's make one thing really clear here. Um, if you want to piss me off, you call it the Shelby County versus Holder case. I don't want my name associated with that case to the extent that I can. So whenever I refer to it, I call it simply the Shelby County case. It is one of the worst opinions, I think, that the Supreme Court has ever um, has ever penned. You know, as a result of the Shelby County case, which really did away with the pre-clearance ability of the Justice Department to look at proposed voter changes, uh, voting changes in, in states that were covered by the Voting Rights Act. We have seen 1,700 polling places closed around the country, which leads to long lines. And while I know everybody's going to be shocked to hear this, longer lines predominantly in communities of color. We have seen voter purges disproportionately in communities of color. And so when Georgia puts in place a law that says you can't give somebody who's waiting in line food or water, you think, well, what is that all about? Well, as Shelby County case, close down some polling places. You make the lines extremely long. You make it difficult for people to stay in line by not being able to give them food or water. So a few people leave, don't actually vote. And the margins in our elections now are so small that if a few people leave the voting lines in a few precincts, maybe that has an impact overall on you know who wins in a local race, who wins in a state race, and who may Look, even Sharon, win. Sharon Beasley lost to be the chief justice the North Carolina Supreme Court by 400 votes. Right, right, yeah. And so these changes, these changes matter. And the thing about the Shelby County case is that, you know, in the case, very famously, um, the chief justice said, America has changed. 
Well, yeah, America has changed, but America is not yet at the place where it needs to be. And if you needed any proof of that, what you said before is extremely important. Immediately after the Shelby County case was decided, a whole range of voter suppression things were put in place in states in the South, predominantly because those were the states covered by the Voting Rights Act, um, that would have been stopped by the Justice Department had the Shelby County case not been put in place. These unnecessary photo ID laws, um, these closing of polling places, the changing of polling locations, a whole range of things happened as a result of the Shelby County case. Justice Ginsburg had it right when she said that uh, the changes that the court is making were gonna have a really negative impact on um, democracy in our, in our country. And uh, the proof has uh, simply been has shown that uh, she was right and that uh, the chief justice was wrong. It was a 5-4 decision. It was an ideological opinion and went against a Congress that in the House voted unanimously, unanimously to uh, say that, yeah, we needed to have a, a further reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. And I think there were only two senators who voted against the reauthorization, signed by a Republican president, George W. Bush. Uh, but the Supreme Court, five justices on the Supreme Court took it upon themselves uh, to do away with an important part of the Voting Rights Act, and now potentially will do away with another part of the Voting Rights Act, that is Section 2, and the ability of private parties to bring um, lawsuits under Section 2. Hold tight one second ago, go to a break. We'll be right back uh, with former Attorney General Eric Holder. We're on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hey, what's up? It's Sammy Roman. Hey, it's John Murray, the executive producer of the new Sherry Shepard Talk Show. It's me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> All right, folks, we're back on Roller Martin Unfiltered. We're talking to the former attorney general, uh, Eric Holder, uh, after uh, he left uh, government, went back into private practice. Uh, I'm sure he was uh, happy uh, to get away from um, the constant daily attacks uh, in conservative media and everywhere else, being attorney general. I, I, I got to say, uh, I, I always got a kick uh, out of uh, your tenure as attorney general uh, when uh you were, I would say, uh, the second boogeyman in America. I swear, they, they uh, the conservatives put every, anything wrong with America uh, p uh, put on you as if uh, as if you were some uh, scary dude who was just trying to sit here and take everybody's rights away. Yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting thing, you know. First black attorney general, and all of a sudden, I became. Uh, you know, like you said, the boogeyman to uh, to Republicans, to conservatives, um, you know, and all I was doing was to try to enforce the law uh, as I understood it to be. And I think really buttressed by, you know, the history and the interpretations of the law that uh, that we advance. But there was something in particular about me as attorney general that really got to got to these folks. I think part of it had to do with the fact that they also were you know, mortified by the fact that there was an African-American um, who was president. And so you will if you look at the attacks, you know, I, I have had some time to reflect on it now. You look at the attacks on on us, that is Barack Obama and on me, uh, the former attorney general. A lot of this stuff was really unhinged. Um, I mean, really kind of crazy stuff, not factually based, um, and really attempts to get at us, um, you know, personally, as opposed to attacking the policy positions that, um, you know, that we took. But, you know, 
part of the game, and I'm proud of the work that we did. I think history is going to be kind to Barack Obama, uh, his tenure as uh, as president, and hopefully we'll look at my time as attorney general in the same way. All right. So you you leave, you're done um, with government. Loretta Lynch uh, takes over once Obama comes out. Uh, then let's talk about uh, this redistricting effort. Um, I, I, I've said it before. I don't have a problem saying it now that I thought one of the biggest mistakes of the Obama presidency uh, was not focusing on uh, not getting the DNC locked and loaded on these uh, these congressional races, these state races all across the country. Um, I thought that uh, it should that uh, you just said something before we went to break that was critically important. And I said this to people then he was only going to be there eight years. But guess what? That infrastructure is still there. Mm -hmm. Party is still there. People still any support still there. And so this effort now, I think, is crucially important because it's really clawing back so much of what was lost in the wake of uh, that Shelby County decision. Uh, and we're seeing the fruits of that labor now. I just wish uh, folks were that aggressive after 2013, or really even before that, uh, because many of us saw this thing coming down the line until it then became reality. Yeah, I think you know there's some validity to the notion that Democrats did not take seriously enough the redistricting that happened in 2011 after, you know, the 2010 election, which, you know, the president um, famously called, uh, you know, a shellacking. Republicans used that power from the 2010 election in 2011 to gerrymander on a scale that we had not seen, you know, for some time. Princeton University did a study and said that that was the worst gerrymandering of the past 50 years. And we've had to live with that, you know, since 2012. I mean, in 2012 was a very, you know, a good example. Uh, you look at the House of Representatives after that gerrymandering done by Republicans, Democrats get 1.4 million more votes than Republicans for the United States House of Representatives and end up with a 33 seat deficit only as a result of um, gerrymandering. That's one of the reasons why we formed up the National Democratic Redistricting Committee to try to make sure that the redistricting done in 2021 was more fair. And that's the deal. I just want to make it fair because if it's fair, Democrats, progressives will do just fine. We don't have to put our thumb on the scale. New York Times has said that the redistricting done in 2021 after we come into existence was the most fair of the past 40 years. Now, it doesn't mean it's perfect. There's still places where we have lawsuits that are pending or we have battles that we still have to win. But we didn't focus as a party um, on the problem of redistricting. We didn't focus enough on state elections. You know, we got all, people got all excited about Barack Obama's running for president, and I get that. But we really did not focus enough on state and local elections, which are really kind of critical and on a day to day basis have a greater impact on people's lives than who's president of the United States and who's actually serves in, in, in Congress. These state legislatures are really, really important places, and that's one of the focuses that I've had as um, the head of the NDRC, really focusing on state elections, state Supreme Court elections, um, local elections. That's where um, the where the Democratic Party has not traditionally um, focused enough attention. And we have to play the long game. We can't get episodically um, involved in this and think that uh, we'll get we'll just focus on this every four years when there's a presidential election. No, we got to play the long game. Every election matters. There's no such thing as an off year election. Um, that's why I worked so hard in 20, just, just these past couple of months uh, in, in Virginia, and we were successful there, why I was campaigning in Ohio, why I was campaigning in Wisconsin for that state Supreme Court race, all in 2023, which is supposedly uh, an off year. We got to focus on every year, every election. They all matter. Okay, let's talk right there about that long game. And uh, I, I swear, I remember, <laughs> I remember 2008. I'm on CNN and um, James Carville, Paul Bagalia, Rahm Emanuel, uh, man, they were always criticizing Howard Dean for his 50 state strategy. Uh, mm -hmm. And they felt he should have been focused really more on the national elections. Uh, and I remember bringing that up, man, Carville got hot with me on the air and I brought it up and I was like, dude, y'all did. I'm like, stop it. I'm like, you know, and, and that was always a thing for me 
that it made no sense when, when again, if you were paying attention, Republicans were like, all right, if we don't have power on the federal level, we're going to run the table in these states. And so what then began to happen, they began to, yes, using gerrymandering, and that's what led to supermajorities. And now it's damn near impossible uh, to break these things up unless you're able uh, to get control of the state Supreme Court. We saw what happened in North Carolina when Democrats finally got control there. Uh, they could have gone up when they Beasley raised 6-1. Now Republicans control it 5-2. Republicans are losing their minds because they no longer control the Wisconsin state Supreme Court. Again, the, these, these are areas that are not sexy. It's not president. It's not United States Senate. But again, those state Supreme Courts, once the Supreme Court said, hey, we're hands off of political gerrymandering, then those state Supreme Courts became even more important. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that point right there, Democrats had better understand you must be thinking 20, 30, 40, 50 years and not just the next election in two years or four years. I was telling one guy, Ellie Mister was on a panel at CBCF, and he was like, we've lost the, we've lost the courts for 50 years. I said, no, Ellie, you haven't. He was like, how so? I said, well, Biden Harris appointed 150 judges. I said, they win in 2024. You could probably say another 200 judges. I said, well, if Democrats win again in 2028, I said, let's say there's another 200 judges. I said, dude, that's 500. I said, we're talking about 550 judges. I said, y'all got to stop thinking, again, so short. Think about how do you win long term to change the country? No, no, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, this focus on well, what's going to happen over the course of the next two years, three, four years. I mean, that's fine. That's a, a good way to spur people to action. But the focus truly has to be over the long term. What's going to happen this decade? What's going to happen over the course of the next 20 years? Um, there's going to be, we're going to have to claw back some of the power that was, I think, unjustifiably taken away from us with regard to that gerrymandering effort in, in 2011 that led to these, you know, these unrepresentative state legislatures. And people need to understand, these state legislatures are the ones that draw the lines for the United States House of Representatives. And so if you have a gerrymandered state legislature, it can draw gerrymandered um, congressional districts for its state, and you end up with a gerrymandered House of Representatives. And so we got to play the long game. And that means making sure, as I said before, every election is going to matter and be thinking that, you know, don't have this defeatist notion. You know, we can't do anything for the next 30, 40 years. Really? I mean, you know, I'm so Dr. King, John Lewis, Diane Nash must have looked at a, a system of American apartheid at some point and said, you know, are we really going to be able to bring this thing down that's been in existence for over 150 years, whatever, you know, 200 years? And yet they did. They played the long game. It didn't happen over the course of a month or just a couple of years. It took a long time for it to happen. And we have to have that same attitude, that same commitment, that same that same commitment uh, to, to long-term change, which means long-term action. We need, you know, not a moment. We need a movement, and that's what uh, I am committed uh, committed to doing. Are you, when we talk about this here, uh, on this particular front here, when when y'all first started um, um, pull, planning this redistricting um, strategy, um, how did you go about it? What I mean by that is, did you throw a map up on a wall and then you say, look, what's low hanging fruit? What's, what's sort of gonna require a lot of work? And then what's gonna be really, really hard? And let's sort of go about this strategy that way. Uh, because a lot of people, whenever we have these conversations, even when I study the civil rights movement, I, people, get, people talk about the speeches, they talk about the results. I always wanna know the strategy. I always wanna know what thought process went into how this got done? What was the focus? Yeah. I mean, to go back to what you said before, we had a state by state strategy. Uh, you know, put the map of the United States up there, see where you saw the worst examples of gerrymandering, both political and racial gerrymandering, and then try to identify in each state who was really important. Governors always matter. State legislators uh, matter. State Supreme Court justices matter. Uh, we found, for instance, that in Ohio, the auditor in Ohio matters. Um, secretaries of state 
matter. Again, not a lot of focus attention mm -hmm. had been placed on them before. And so he said, all right, we got to make sure that we elect people to those positions uh, in the states that we're going to focus on. We didn't have a, a strategy that said we're going to be focused on Idaho or, or, or Utah. You know, if, if we can do some things there, we will. But there are places like Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, um, you know, Virginia, the states in the south where we can really have an impact. So we had an electoral strategy. We also said, all right, where is it that we can bring lawsuits that will be um, effective? Identified those places and what will be the legal strategy that we would use. And then also we said, all right, how, where are the places where if we just get people focused on this issue, raise the consciousness of the people about the importance of redistricting, the negative impacts of gerrymandering, where, if we bring that to people's consciences, where can we have an impact um, as well? So we had this multi-pronged strategy in a variety uh, of states, but that focus, you know, we started up in January of 2017, and the, the focus for those first few months, that first year, was all about strategy. What is it that we're going to do? Where are we going to do it? How are we going to do what it is that we say uh, we want to do? How are we going to implement this? How are we going to raise the money for it? And then by 20, late 2017, and then since then, you know, we've been out there, and I think that you know we have been um, pretty effective. I, I know we've been pretty doing pretty well because Republicans are attacking us as you know using their usual unhinged stuff. Up oh, here comes Holder again and Obama, and they're doing all kinds of negative things. And when I start to see those articles, I know that uh, they're starting to feel uh, the positive impacts of the things that we have been doing. The uh, I, I love your whole point about uh, the the folks who go oh, oh, oh woe is me and 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 I must say uh, Eric my God that's the one thing that probably just drives me crazy about uh, lots uh, of Democrats and, and I just really think of people uh, and I say this about young folks and others and understand look. You ain't got the stuff you got today because it happened in six months. Right. I mean, it was like it was literally clawing. It was it was a slog to sit here and, and just grab you know the terrain piece by piece. Uh, it wasn't just like, oh, came in and man, we just carpet bomb the joint. Here we go. We won. No, that's just not how these things happen. And then people tell me, well, Roland, we don't you know, we don't want to sit here and hear that where, you know, it's going to take time, but it's, that's real. No, it is real. I mean, it's not something that happens overnight. People should be impatient, but that impatience should drive you to action, not despair. You know, if you're not optimistic, it seems to me that pessimism leads to inaction. Optimism leads to involvement. And so I look back and see that America's better now than it was 50 years ago, better than it was 50 years before that. It's not yet at the place where we need to be, but people gave up their lives. They gave up their lives so that I would have opportunities that they did not. My father served in World War II, and while he was in uniform in this country, was told to get to the back of a bus in North Carolina, told to go around the corner, uh, to get a hamburger while he was in Oklahoma in World War II while he was in uniform, and his boy became Attorney General of the United States. Now, that's progress. It didn't happen overnight, but that's the kind of progress that we have to fight for. We have to play the long game. We have to understand that it's going to take some time, but don't be satisfied and say, well, you know, it's going to be some time in the future. No, I, I fight for change now, understanding that it may take a little longer than a day, a year to get it done. But we owe a great deal to people who sacrifice for us. And we dishonor that legacy if we don't commit ourselves to the kind of action that they were prepared to uh, engage in. And we sacrifice the future of people who will come after us unless we do our part now to protect our democracy and to advance the cause of civil rights. Uh, hold tight one second, going to break. We come back, I wanna talk about your book. Uh, on this very issue, folks, uh, we are talking with the former Attorney General Eric Holder right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. I'm Farai Muhammad, live from L.A. 
and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. All right, folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network, our conversation uh, with the former Attorney General, Eric Holder. Uh, folks, he's got a, I, I call it a new book, came out last year, but if you don't know about it, it's new. Uh, it's called Our Unfinished March, The Violent Past and Imperiled Future of the Vote, A History, A Crisis, A Plan. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the vote with regards to uh, so much of this. Um, and before we went to the break, we were talking about, again, sort of how y'all targeted the state by state states looking at this. Um, and I look at now the Congressional Black Caucus is its largest ever. Uh, if these positions, if these uh, if the court cases in Florida, Georgia, which what happened in Alabama, Louisiana, potentially you could have four to six new CBC members. Um, and obviously we see what Republicans are doing in North Carolina, trying to gerrymander. We see what's happening uh, in Wisconsin. We see what's happening in New York State as well. And I sort of try to t explain this to people. Understand, when, people, when we talk about representation and 58, it could be 60 plus members of the Congressional Black Caucus, we're now talking about billions and billions of dollars mm -hmm. coming into areas that before didn't exist. That's sort of how I try to explain to people why this matters. They're like, well, man, I don't know what other position means. I'm like, uh, trust me, the difference between there likely being a black Democrat and a white Republican in that position has a direct impact on money from the federal government, government coming to those 700,000 residents that make up a congressional district. No, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, you look at what Democrats did when they were in charge of the United States House of Representatives and they put in place measures that reduced the level of childhood poverty in this country by 50 percent, 50 percent. And that happened almost like overnight. And then Republicans take over, don't reauthorize the program. And we are now seeing the levels of childhood um, poverty and uh, hunger um, go go up. And so, you know, these things really, really matter. People need to understand that, the, that it, in a lot of ways, this is about power, you know? And for too long, I think Democrats and progressives have been unwilling to say that, you know, we want power. And then to use that power, not the way Republicans do, but for the good of the people. But this notion of, well, I'm a little a little squeamish about saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm seeking power and I want to use power. We got to get over that, you know, because the reality is that if you have good people with power, they can do good things for the vast majority of the people in, uh, in, in this country. And we, have, we certainly saw that when Democrats were in charge of the House of Representatives. Um, we see it in state legislatures where, where Democrats have power and they expand Medicaid and poor people get get health coverage. Rural hospitals 
are, are supported as a result of the expansion of Medicaid. And this is something that's extremely popular, has not happened in Wisconsin because of the gerrymandered Republican legislature there. Um, it hasn't happened in other states, even though the people want it to happen because of gerrymandering with these folks who only have to worry about a primary and not a general election. They do things inconsistent with the desires of their constituents and, fate and suffer no political consequence. That's one of the most pernicious parts of, um, of, of gerrymandering. It really, it really hinders um, progress that people want to see happen but the minority of people who have these gerrymandered representatives uh, stop it from actually occurring. And that's why I think that um, uh, as you talk about uh, the, the history of the vote, um, especially when you say the violent past, but also I dare say the violent present. Here's why. And, and, and I keep reminding my listeners and my viewers this. When Donald Trump was complaining in 2020 about losing, he kept mentioning four cities. He kept saying Fulton County, which is Atlanta, Philadelphia, Detroit, and Milwaukee. Um, when they did, a par- they did a partial recount in Wisconsin, the Trump campaign, and that partial recount was only in Milwaukee. And I keep telling people, January 6th, was about them them being pissed off that black people turned out in huge numbers. And I tell folks, don't make any mistake about it. That was about how dare, because remember, he was thanking black people in 2016 for not voting. He was not saying that four years later. Yeah, I mean, January 6th has a whole bunch of things that drove people to do really unbelievable things at the Capitol that day and then subsequent um, to January the 6th, these election deniers. Uh, a lot of it has to do with you know people of color turning out in really significant numbers. It also has to do with young people turning out in really significant numbers. And you know they have since that time tried to put in place measures that are going to make it more difficult for uh, African-Americans, Hispanics, young people um, to, to vote. And so we've got to be prepared for a fight that really is about what kind of America are we going to have? You know, this is a changing America. This nation is becoming more brown. That's just a fact. You know, I think we say 2050, they're going to be more people of color than white folks in this country. I think it's now come down to 2043. Um, And that can be really a source of strength for this nation. It makes us more competitive around the world against more homogenous nations. Or it can be a source of great division if it is used by politicians uh, to try to stoke, you know, fear and divisiveness among um, the American people. And so uh, that's what these elections are all about. What kind of America do you want? That's what the 2024 election is really going to be about. This is a, 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 you know, all elections matter, but the 2024 elections are really about our democracy more than anything else. Are we going to have a true democracy in this nation what kind of America are, are we going to have? And so you tell me you're not voting or that you don't care or that it doesn't matter. You're getting on the wrong side of me because, again, that doesn't honor the legacy of those who sacrificed before. And it flies in the face of just logic uh, about what kind of country um, we're going to be if Republicans and these MAGA Republicans um, um, take over. On, on on that particular point, there, um, uh, as you were, uh, would you were laying this this out? We say our unfinished march. Yeah. Again, I, I'm always trying. I talk about connecting the dots because I think sometimes what happens is p- some people think about voting and go, <clears throat> well, that's just that one thing, but there's a direct correlation between representation, voting resources, bridges, schools. I mean, if we could start sitting here, just start going uh, like connect, 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 connect. And then when I hear the people who go, no, we got to do for self. We can't, we we can't care about government. And I keep saying Elon Musk is the richest person in the world. And because of government subsidies. So I'm like, and and, and I'm like, so y'all get, y'all can miss me with all that, you know, uh, pull yourself up because corporations in America, uh, oil companies, 
tech companies, you name it, they all look to the government for assistance and help. Yeah, all I mean, you know, well, no, that, that's, you know, <laughs> elections matter in really, really significant ways. I talked before about, you know, the the lowering in a significant way of childhood hunger. And you're right, there's trillions of dollars, you know, billions and trillions of dollars that get distributed by the federal government. And the question is, where does that money go? And for what purpose? Uh, if you've got Democrats in charge, as opposed to MAGA Republicans in charge, you're going to see fundamentally different priorities. Uh, you know, the Donald Trump administration had a tax cut of $1.7 trillion, whatever it was. That money was designed to help corporations and fat cats, as opposed to helping the American people, uh, those people who need the greatest amount of assistance. And so elections matter. Your vote matters. If your vote didn't matter, if you're an individual and you think your vote didn't matter, why the hell do you think they're trying to make it so difficult for you to exercise that vote? They understand, the other side understands how important an individual vote is, how important a collective effort by particular communities are. They understand all of that. And so we've got to be just as smart as they are, just as committed as they are, and play the long game the long game um, as effectively as, as they have. Um, I, I like it what you laid out there when you said um, a history, a crisis, a plan. And um, the, the thing that is interesting, and, and I, I got my, like it drives me sort of crazy. I explained to people, because you said it, if your vote wasn't so powerful, why would we be trying to stop it? But not using it actually strengthens them in trying to stop us. And so when folks say, I don't see any changes, so therefore I'm going to sit the, sit the re-election out, I'm saying what you're actually doing, the thing that you say you don't like, that's what actually helped create the supermajorities. That's what actually helped create the takeover of Supreme Courts. Uh, that's what helped in my, in my native Texas taking over the school, the, uh, the Board of Education and now controlling curriculum and now being able to throw throw uh, out certain books. Ron DeSantis is not the governor of Florida if Andrew Gillum picks up 31,000 votes. Right. Enough yep. about 30,000 votes. And so I'm always saying, folks, do understand, when you choose to sit at home, you're actually empowering those who are steadfast against you. Well, that's exactly right, because here's the reality. There are more of us, that is people who agree with, from my perspective, progressive principles, um, than there are MAGA Republicans. There are more of us than them. If we vote, we win. It really is as simple as that. Now, it's going to be- They've actually said it. They've said if we allow ballot drop boxes and we send absentee ballots out, we will lose. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, all right, we vote, we win. And here's the, what you say is really, really important. If we don't participate in the process, we create a vacuum that gets filled then by people who are less committed, who are less focused on the needs of people of color in particular. Uh, we get people who are less committed to our, our democratic system, and they will be the ones who will decide, you know, the, the, the direction of the nation in terms of policy. They'll be the ones who decide how elections are, are actually held. They'll, they'll be the ones who decide, you know, who gets federal funds and who gets the necessary financial uh, assistance. That's the vacuum that you create by not participating in the system. And it's, it's something I think that is irresponsible. It's just irresponsible. Your first responsibility uh, as an American citizen, I think, is to simply vote. You know, I've held a number of titles in my life. I've been attorney general, deputy attorney general. I've been a judge. Um, you know, but the most important title is the one that I have right now, and that's American citizen. And the most important thing I can do as an American citizen is to fight for our democracy. And the most fundamental way I can do that is to vote and to use the, whatever power I have to get other people to vote um, as well. People should not underestimate the power of their vote. The civil rights movement was all about empowering people to vote. You know, the, the Selma to Montgomery March, 
people, you know, here, that's, that's a legendary thing, the Edmund Pettus Bridge. That was about getting people in Alabama the right to vote. Dr. King understood that better than anything. There's, economic, there's an economic part of the civil rights struggle, certainly. But the core, the core of the civil rights movement was getting people the right to vote. So as you have uh, gone about this country, as you've done book signings uh, as well, um, who's in the audience? Because when I look at the numbers, and let's just be real clear, historically, we understand that, frankly, older voters vote off the charts. It's always 65 plus, then it's 50 to 64. But as you go down, it gets less and less and less. And one of the things, and this is not about gaslighting millennials or Gen Z, I use the opposite. I say all the time, hey, y'all got the numbers. It's True. more y'all than baby boomers. Right. It's more y'all than Gen X. But guess what? Demographics don't mean a damn thing if you don't use it to your advantage. No, that's exactly right. I mean, the largest voting block in the country now, young people, not baby boomers. Uh, you know, I'm a baby boomer and we have disproportionate amounts of power because we vote in greater proportions than young people do. And, you know, young people are the ones that have the most at stake. What's the climate going to look like? What's our democracy going to look like? What are the ability of women to decide what they are going to do with their bodies? These are all the kinds of things that will affect the younger generation to a much greater degree than it will affect those of us who are in the fourth quarter, you know, of, of our lives. And so they have much more um, at stake. And yet young people don't vote in ways that they could. There is huge amounts of power. Again, we get back to that, that whole notion of power, huge amounts of power that young people leave on the table because they don't engage in the process. We saw in Wisconsin, in that election for that Wisconsin State Supreme Court race, Janet Prosewitz, she uh, was a great candidate. She's going to be a great um, justice on the Supreme Court. She turned out young people in that election. And in what is a 50-50 state, she won by 11 points largely because of getting African-Americans and young people out to vote for her. There's a lot to be learned from that Wisconsin um, race. You energize young people, you energize people uh, of color. Uh, you can really build winning coalitions. It's about putting together again, you know, the Obama coalition of 2008. That is a governing coalition. It's power that we need to be able to acquire and then use for appropriate purposes. Hold tight one second, going to our final break. We come back, we'll finish our conversation with former Attorney General Eric Holder right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. Angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage. As a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear.
All right, folks, welcome back to Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. We're talking with former AG Eric Holder. Uh, he uh, is involved uh, in the redistricting uh, effort. It's a long ass title. What's, what, what's that long title? The National Democratic Redistricting Committee, better known as the NDRC. All right, see all them acronyms. It's like NDRC, DSDC, DCCC, DGA, all them acronyms. All right, so so let's just look. Let's, let's survey because <clears throat> it was so funny. I was sitting here uh, and I was commenting under something a post from Amanda Seals, and she said, "Hey, okay, Roland, you're right. What 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 should we be doing?" Because uh, uh, she said, "Yeah, we get it. You were you were and are right now. Based on your knowledge, can you provide any actions, ideas on how to challenge, manage?" this reversion of rights. And we were talking about, because <clears throat> it was a video she posted about the Eighth Circuit. Uh, and so I, I said, well, yeah, first and foremost, you got to keep the Senate, you got to keep the White House. Uh, and so as, as you look at the map, as you look at uh, the success that y'all had so far, where should we as African-Americans, where should we be looking at focusing on? What, what states, what positions? Yeah. I mean, the, the focus for us now, certainly, you know, we had that big win in Alabama. We will, I think, have another one in Louisiana. A uh, big elect, big uh, decision that helped us at the state and federal level in Georgia. I think we're going to do fine in Florida in, in the courts. Wisconsin, we've had a victory there. I expect that you'll see a lawsuit there to try to break up that gerrymander. In Ohio, um, there's going to be a ballot measure um, in uh, at the end of next year, November of next year, to really do away with the legislature drawing the, the lines and put in place a system, an independent commission to draw the lines. Uh, we'll see what happens in the New York State case and whether the independent commission can redraw the lines there as well. But I mean, I think this problem of gerrymandering is one that we're going to have to focus in a whole variety of states, not just in the South. Um, this is something that is not only Southern, it's Midwestern, it's far Western. Um, and so uh, those are the, the places, you know, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Michigan. Uh, these are places that um, that are going to be a, a continuing focus um, for us. We're, we're in an era now of almost perpetual redistricting. You know, we used to do it just once a, every 10 years and for a year. Yeah, now, but it was with my state. It was um, not 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 Dick Army, that other dude, uh, Tom, Tom DeLay. DeLay. Tom, Tom DeLay. DeLay, they did it in the middle of right. the 10 year deal. And, and in fact, they were they were helped by black Democrat Ron Wilson, uh, whose name is still mud in Texas, especially in Houston, uh, because it created a congressional district that he thought he was going to win. He got molly whopped. Uh, right. And that's why we got Judge Al Green. Uh, and since then, they don't care. Their whole deal is the moment we get power, we're taking over. Look at North Carolina. They they took over the state Supreme Court. They chose to go back and reopen three cases that the court had just decided and flipped it in the first three in the first month. Right. Right. Yeah. When I mean, they get power, they wield power. Right. I mean, North Carolina is a great example of that. You know, they win state Supreme Court races there and go and reverse basically a Supreme Court precedent that was only months old. And that allows the Republicans to do some really serious gerrymandering that I, I fear we're going to have to deal with yet again. Even though we beat them before, we're going to have to go back into North Carolina and try to, you know, try to beat them um, yet again. And, you know, that whole notion, as I was saying before, of perpetual redistricting is something that people need to take into consideration. And this is real, pre pretty amazing. If you look at the maps in 2014, the congressional maps, those maps have not been the same for any election cycle. That is every two years since 2014. 2016 was different than 14, 18, 20, 22. Every one of those maps has been different because of perpetual redistricting. And that's why, again, we've got to play the long game. Don't just show up every 10 years and think, all right, now it's time to redistrict. No, we got to prepare for uh, Republicans trying to do things mid-cycle or even, even beyond mid-cycle every year. We got to protect the gains um, that we have made and we got to put in place reforms so that with the system is simply more fair. And that's all I'm fighting for. I just want it to be fair because if it's fair, I tell everybody, if it's fair, Democrats and progressives, we will do just fine. We don't have to cheat. We don't have to put our thumb on the scale like Republicans have to do. Well, a, a perfect example, uh, look at Wisconsin. Democrats win a special election by 11 points. That We call that a blowout these days. Right. Uh, and Republicans threatened to impeach the Democrat that won 
if she dared participate in the political gerrymandering case. Why? Because they know they're going to lose because Democrats now control the Wisconsin State Supreme Court four to three. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's an amazing thing. Janet Protasiewicz runs a great, uh, a, a great case, makes, you know, tell, essentially, you know, talks about her concerns about uh, reproductive rights, her concerns about the state of democracy in um, Wisconsin. Doesn't say how she's going to vote in a particular case. Um, and yet Republicans are so afraid that even before the case is before her, they said they're going to impeach her. I mean, think about that. She wins an election by 11 points. And what's their reaction? We'll impeach her. Oh, I mean, this is how far they have gone. And, you know, they think it, it, there's an arrogance there. There's a belief that they should have the right to make all the calls. They have a right to power. That's their, that's their view. And they're, they're afraid of having other people who, ha, who might have power and do things differently. But that arrogance that they have, that their, view, or their views are the ones that have to prevail, that they're the only ones who should be, have an ability to decide, is something that we've got to be prepared to fight and fight as strongly as we possibly can. Um, again, when, when you're when you're looking at uh, again looking at that map, first of all, huge wins in Alabama, huge wins uh, in Louisiana. Uh, now, granted, this is not what your organization uh, is focused on, but what I keep saying is, you can't have Louisiana, the second uh, blackest state in the union, and the turnout is horrendous. So y'all are fighting these battles in court, but I'm like, black people, we got to be showing up. Uh, in these races, Republicans, they had, they had three uh, runoff races on Saturday. They won all three, including state treasurer, including secretary of state uh, and uh, state attorney general. They now control all statewide uh, races uh, in Louisiana. We see how that's how what, what that has meant in Texas and Mississippi and Alabama. We see what has meant in Florida. Uh, and so I, I'm just also saying to our people, we can't have our legal warriors winning in the courtroom and then when it comes to actually showing up then 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 uh we're not turning up uh i also i would say that um look we got to be focused on the north carolina supreme court yep. uh that's a perfect place where when 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 dems took control of the supreme court they ruled against racial that they they called it racial gerrymandering they stopped republican legislation from doing a whole bunch of stuff now they control the House, the Senate, and the Supreme Court. Now they can overrule the governor anytime they want. Yeah, and that's about playing the long game. All right, so they took over the Supreme Court with those Supreme Court victories, I guess, last year, year before. And so you, long game tells me, all right, so when's the next Supreme Court race in, or the next Supreme Court races in North Carolina? And I think that takes us all the way up to 26 and then 28. And so we need to start planning now. Get the best candidates who will run the best campaigns and put the and make sure they're adequately funded so that we can have in place people who will call, you know, these cases on the facts and the law and based on, you know, good, good precedent. One thing I would say about our organization, yeah, we're, we're a legal organization and we bring a lot of lawsuits. But we also focus on, you know, preventing voter suppression. And we also focus on turnout, because what you said is exactly right. I can put in place, you know, great structures through um, bringing, you know, lawsuits. If people don't vote, these great structures that we put in place really don't matter. And so what we have tried to do is be make sure that we have a great electoral program, make sure that we are bringing, you know, good lawsuits, but also making sure that we are energizing people to get out and to vote. And that's been a big part of the conversation that we've been having today and something that I hope people will hear from this former attorney general. You need to get yourself to the polls every time there is an election. Understand that if you don't vote, other people who are not sharing your worldview are going to have power that you are giving to them. All right. Well, Eric Holder, always glad to chat with you. Glad to see you. We always bump into each other uh, in and around the city. Uh, You're a man about town. I'm always seeing you doing social stuff. I, I'm not out there nearly as much as you are, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. You always come over with Sharon. So, uh, and, and, and let her know. She's been talking smack for about seven, eight years about her gumbo, and I ain't had it yet. So, uh <laughs> Let, don't let, mess with it now. She's a Mobile, Alabama woman now. That, that don't mean nothing. My grandparents from Opelousas, Louisiana. In time, she ready to have gumbo wars. Let's go. Let's do it, man. All right. Have a great holidays. All right, man. Have a good one, too. Thanks so All much right, for take having care. me. Thanks a lot. 
Folks, that's it for us. Fantastic show. I want y'all to have a fabulous Thanksgiving. Uh, but don't, uh, don't, don't think that, look, although we're not going to be live uh, on the show, we've got some great content lined up for you. Some great generational conversations. Janetta B. Cole, uh, President Emerita. Uh, she, of course, is the president of Spellman and Bennett College. Well, she sits down with activist Tiffany Lofton. Trust me, it is an amazing conversation. SNCC leader Charles Cobb and Philip Agnew. I got rapper Chris and Chuck D. I got Bree Newsome, Reverend William Barber, Cliff Albright sitting down with a uh, former Atlanta mayor and ambassador Andrew Young. Folks, it is some unbelievable conversations. And Brittany Pagnett sits down with former Labor Secretary Alexis Herman. You will not uh, be disappointed with these conversations, folks. So be sure to check those things out over the next couple of days while we take some time off with our staff uh, and get ourselves um, revived and re-energized, hanging out with our families for Thanksgiving. So again, I hope you all enjoyed this show. Please, please support us in what we do by joining the Black Star, by the Black Star Network, Bring the Funk Fan Club. Send your check-in money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is R. M. Unfiltered Zale, rolling at rollinsmartin.com, rolling at rollinmartinunfiltered.com. Also, be sure to join our Brina, join, uh, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds, available at bookstores nationwide. Download the audio version. Yes, I'm reading it on Audible and be sure to watch our 24-hour, seven-day-a-week streaming channel. We're on four fast channels, including Amazon News. You can check it out, go through Amazon Fire to get to Amazon News. You can tell Alexa to play news from the Black Star Network, Plex TV, Amazon Freebie, Amazon Prime Video. All right, folks, you have a great Thanksgiving. Be well. Holla! Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Black Power. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Thank you.